This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcasters Orion Samuelson and Max Armstrong and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH and your local Case IH dealer. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, some very early corn harvest reports coming in. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to our weekend visit here, and it's always a pleasure to be alongside Mr. Mike Pearson. Good to see you. Good to see you as well, Max. What are you hearing on corn harvest across the country? You know, this is the time we start to get a few reports coming in. We'll watch for results of the seed corn harvest, some early indications there. As you know, some farmers like to market corn early if they can, even if they have some high moisture corn. Sometimes there are grain elevators that want it. Absolutely, or livestock feeders. It's close to silage cutting time. All of it's around That's the corner. Right. Some harvest has been going on in Texas, way south, I guess, in what you'd call the Corn Belt, maybe south of the Corn Belt. But Chad Colby has a report on what's been going on there and some of the disappointing yields. Thanks, Max. We know when wheat harvest here in the Midwest slows down, it's time to start thinking about the Farm Progress Show. And before we can do that, there's always a little bit of an excitement in the air because we start seeing corn being harvested from our friends down in the south. This footage you've been looking at is from Kimbrell Farms. Their operation is located south of Dallas in a town called Itasca. They're in that area. And if you've been following the weather at all over the last, I would say, two or three months, you know that they've been hit pretty hard with drought and those yields, well, they're not what they expected. The footage you're looking at, that corn's yielding about 75 bushel. They're used to corn yields well north of 125 in that area, so it's a real concern. The other challenge in that area is too, cotton is being aborted, meaning it's not even going to make a crop. And the bigger concern is the livestock, as you can see in this footage right here. They're bailing anything they can behind these combines to help support the livestock in that area. The weekly crop bulletins out of Texas show conditions certainly not very good at all. In fact, 42% of the corn in Texas, poor or very poor. You take a look at the cotton, as many traders have been keeping an eye on that, about 39% of it is poor or very poor. Even the grain sorghum isn't doing that well. 48% of it, poor to very poor. And the range and pasture conditions, 85% poor to very poor in the Lone Star State. Wow, it is a challenge for growers across the Southern Plains, Max, that is for sure. You know, recently I had the chance to visit with Chris Thrasher of Agroxene, a company that is bringing biological technology to agriculture. We talked about how that would look as this moves forward. Agroxene um, is a plant-based uh, health company um, based out of Bocazé, France. Started in 2014, um, main focus was on delivering, of course, health for plants. Um, as they have grown over the years, they really have grown into some acquisitions here in the U.S., which is how I came to work for Agraxine, and really focused on delivering plant-based products um, that kind of alleviate some of those stresses that consumers, growers, producers see out in the field. And there are lots of stresses, Chris. As you think about how the biological market is growing so quickly, what is it about biologicals that, that are making farmers figure out how to fit them into their crop plans. Well, that's, that's really the interesting thing is, you know, I've been in the biological business for about nine years and really seeing the adoption curve for this type of technology is, you know, we're really delivering natural solutions to those most common problems that we see in the field. So as farmers are looking at biologicals, still a little iffy about using biologicals. Are they, are they for real? Can they really do those things that they're claiming? Um, really starting to see some adoption because we are able to deliver some of those offensive and defensive uh, mechanisms that we really try to position to the grower and to the consumer. I've heard that offensive and defensive phrase used a few times you know, when we're discussing biologicals. Chris, what does it mean? What does it mean to be defensive and how is offensive different? So really defensive, you've already got a problem. You know. You're related to sports, you know, you're already, you're already down or, you know, you need to really kind of come back. Well, that's what we really look at when we look at uh, crop-based problems, um, either a, a late season fungus, uh, late season blight, I um, mean, your specialty crops. Those are things that really takes a little more of a quick action to correct. 
Um, most biologicals currently, now I say currently because we're still evolving as an industry, is most biologicals currently are looked at as an offensive solution to kind of prevent those things from happening. So more of a preventative versus a curative type solution. And I really think that's where biologicals currently fit in the marketplace is being that, you know, natural preventative solution to most of those issues facing the growers today. Chris, you mentioned the development you've seen in this space over the past nine years, and it seems like that change is accelerating. What are you excited about as you look to the future? Well, I'm really excited about how we can deliver, you know, not only what we traditionally look at biologicals as being bio-nutrition, more nitrogen use efficiency, uh, nutrient use efficiency, but also looking at uh, what biocontrols can do. And Chris, for listeners who are curious about biologicals, where can they go to get more information? Well, of course, I'd like for you to start with Audroxine USA, but um, really what I encourage people to do is to do their own homework. You know, don't really rely on what a website tells you or what, um, you know, what, you know, someone that may stop by your farm trying to um, position biologicals, but look to your local universities. That's usually the most trusted advisors when it comes to information. You know, I really encourage the consumer to give biologicals a chance and to look to those companies that they trust and like I said, that's really something that we want to be at the end of the day is that trusted partner in your biological solutions. That was Chris Thrasher, Director of North America for Agroxine. You can get more information by visiting agroxine.com. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag Dealer Network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit firestoneag.com to find your local certified dealer. And now it's time to talk markets. Matt Bennett of agmarket.net joins us today. And Matt, this past week was really interesting. It seemed like more of the outside market stuff was having an impact on ag prices than ag stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things kind of weighing in, but uh, there's recession fears for sure. I mean, it'd be pretty hard to say that we're not entering uh, or, or in the initial stages of, of a recession situation. Uh, talking about another maybe a point hike, you know, as far as interest rates are concerned, I think it's got a lot of folks a little bit wary. And quite frankly, you know, anybody that's been long some of these commodity markets has been bitten very hard over the last several weeks. So I think there's a lot of money that's kind of been pulled off the table. Uh, you look at what happened in crude, you know, uh, uh, China talks about some, uh, you know, COVID mandates and whatnot and locking people down. And all of a sudden uh, on a couple of the, these days, you saw crude down seven, eight, nine dollars. I mean, you can't rally commodities whenever you look at that kind of trade in the energies. Gotcha. So with that going on the outside, let's take a focus back to the issues that are moving the ag commodities. Matt, you travel quite a bit. What have you seen on this corn crop across the country? How's it looking? I'll tell you, it's feast or famine, you know, and, I, and so if I talk about what's happening in my own backyard, people are going to get out you because quite frankly, I've been blessed uh, this year. Uh, none of us got to start as early as what we wanted to. We all know that, you know, but we started around uh, April 20th, 21st, right there in uh, my part of central Illinois. We never got that big pond filling rain, you know, to where we had to go back in and replant a bunch. That's something that has happened every year uh, since 2012 quite frankly. Okay, so this was a very similar start to 2012, which makes you a little nervous, but then we got rainfall uh, since then, like 2018. And so uh, there's some really good potential. Uh, I drove up, uh, you know, obviously from uh, uh, central Illinois up to, uh, up to Batavia. I'll tell you what, I didn't see a bad cornfield the entire yeah. time. Yeah, but that's not true. I hear as you get farther and farther west, Matt, and how is the market weighing these two discrepancies? Potential big crop out east, real trouble out west. Yeah, the, so the flip side, you know, some folks I talk to, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, uh, Missouri, they're telling me, even parts of Iowa, that they miss rains, continue to miss rains, and they could be looking at a 2012 type scenario. And so, you know, how's the market weighing this? Well, I think at this stage of the game, it's, it's struggling with it, quite frankly. You know, there's a lot of people out there saying 175, some saying 177, some I'm saying above 177. Uh, I think that the true uh, number is going to take a long time to figure out. And I think a very interesting thing when we get to talking about it is where it's really bad, there's a lot of usage. There's a lot of cattle. You know, you get out west, uh, and quite frankly, they're using a ton of corn in that part of the world, and I don't think they're going to have it to harvest, unfortunately. Well, as you think about the, the demand side, you've got cattle, ethanol demand. Matt, how's that holding up this summer? Ethanol demand's been pretty darn good. Our ethanol numbers this week got back up to about 100. 
105 million bushels of corn grind. I'll tell you what, that's a good number. USDA is likely going to have to raise that number, uh, which is going to help a little bit considering our exports are kind of going in towards the end of the marketing year without a whole lot of fanfare. Yeah, that's the truth. And are you concerned that exports might stay low as we go through really the remainder of this marketing season? You know, Brazil, there's no question they had a big crop. Safrina so crop was good, significantly better than what we saw a year ago. But I'll tell you what, when we get out farther past into uh, our harvest time frame into like Dees, Jan, Feb, I think that we're going to pick up quite a bit of business. A lot of that's going to depend on is Ukraine corn going to be able to hit the world market? A uh, lot of talks that it was going to be able to this week. Uh, that weighed on the market, let's just be honest about it, but there's still a lot to be done. I mean, that, that's a very sketchy situation. It is. When we come back, we're going to talk wheat in a little more detail. Folks, we'll be back for more with Matt Bennett from agmarket.net. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. Welcome back. We're talking markets with Matt Bennett of agmarket.net. And Matt, before we went to break, you mentioned this question hanging over the world wheat market. Will Russian supplies be allowed to trade? What does the market think? Can it happen physically? You know, this week, uh, Egypt came out and said that they were going to be tendering for wheat, but they weren't going to take any Russia or Ukraine wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a feature that uh, I think a lot of folks were kind of on the sidelines cheering, maybe not too loudly, but uh, uh, certainly happy to see someone take that stance. But, uh, you know, in the past uh, couple of weeks, you've had people gathering together. You know, you had a gathering in Turkey, and there, it's mostly business leaders trying to figure out how can we get corn and wheat out of Ukraine. Uh, that's all fine and well, but you probably need to get some politicians involved uh, some of the folks that, uh, you know, can ensure some safety factors because, uh, let's face it, uh, trying to convince someone to go in there and haul a load out is probably not going to be a very easy conversation. No, it's certainly going to take uh, a lot of dollars to get, yes. get a ship into the Black Sea right now. Absolutely. Matt, thinking ahead to this harvest, corn, soybeans, we're looking at this crop. Do you guys have a yield estimate on either crop yet? You know, we don't have an official yield estimate, but I'm just going to basically shoot from the hip here. My personal opinion, let's start with soybeans, is that the bean crop went in the ground late. We all know that. And you talk to anybody, whether it's university experts or seed company, we want to get the beans in the ground as early as we possibly can. So they went in the ground late. And quite frankly, you talk to a lot of producers and they're going to tell you, my corn crop looks better, relatively speaking, than my bean crop. I've heard that all uh, over and over this year. And so a lot of forecasts are kind of converging on a little bit of a warmer, dry, August. If that happens to be the case, I struggle to believe that we can even eclipse 50, let alone 51 and a half. So we have to be very cautious as to assume that this bean crop is going to be made, even though the corn crop really was benefited, for instance, in the I states with some really beneficial rainfall in the month of July. So uh, there's two different tales there. As far as corn's concerned, right now you've got to assume there's going to be some records set in part of the corn belt. All right. I know that if you're sitting in Nebraska or if you're sitting in uh, Kansas, you don't want to hear that. And I, I understand that. That's very frustrating. Uh, how much are those areas going to take uh, to be able to draw them up? You know, mm -hmm. and so I do think there will be counties in Illinois that will set records. I think that there will be producers that set all time records on their farms. Uh, and, and I think that that will be, again, probably in your I states, uh, uh, Illinois and Iowa, and some of Indiana as well. But I think that it's, again, a feast versus famine. It's going to be really hard to come up with a number. Quite frankly, right now I'm sitting around 176. I think it would be tough to get above 177 without a massive weather shift in, in the very short, short term future. And meanwhile, cattle feeders are having to buy that high price corn. Matt, look out for the remainder of this year, maybe early 2023. Where do you see this cattle market going? Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, whenever you look at the, whether you're talking feeders or fats, your mm -hmm. numbers are, are not robust by any means. We all know that, and that's the way it's been for quite some time. Uh, and with feed costs where they've been, it's been uh, uh, understandable that you would have some restriction there. Uh, but as you move forward, now you've seen pretty decent relief as far as your feed costs go, especially compared to $7.50 and $8 corn. Uh, moving forward, given the cattle numbers where they're at, if we don't have a massive meltdown in the equities, I think that feeders and fats are going to be excellent products property. Now, do I want to buy 186 feeders uh, right now and feed $6 corn? That's a tough call. But I do think, again, whenever you look at the numbers, you get out in the first and second quarter of 23, I think that your fat cattle market is going to be on fire. All right. Could get interesting. Matt Bennett, agmarket.net. Thanks for joining us this week. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. 
combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. High tech? Well, we'll see. It looks like a throwback to another day here with Mr. Colby this weekend. It's not uncommon this time of year when you're driving around looking at fields to see weed control simply not be effective. On this week's tech segment, I'm going to show you a new piece of technology that my good friend Matt Foes was adding to his self-propelled sprayer. Quite honestly, when I pulled into the driveway, I wasn't really sure what I was going to see, except I did see another attachment, Matt, and I know how you're not fans of that. Talk a little bit about the problem and your solution. So the problem this year is that uh, planting beans early in April, you extend the amount of time you need the residual herbicide to hold on to. Well, some water hemp, some giant ragweed got through that, and now I have to deal with them because being non-GMO, I don't have a lot of get out of jail free cards post-emergence. It looked to me like pretty simple installation too. This is an old school product. I remember my dad using some technology just like this when I was a young man. I'm sure it's been on the Foes farm in the past. Yeah, back when we were kids, we had rope wicks on the loader bucket going across the field trying to put Roundup on weeds. Now it's a different product going through it, but it's the same idea of a sponge applicator wiping product onto the weeds as you go across the field. And it looks very simple to mount. Looks like it's not going to take you very long to get this thing mounted. What about cost? You know, uh, for, for 80 feet, is, and, and I'm going to be a little short of that on this sprayer, uh, it, was, it was a little over $5,000, close to six maybe with some hardware. But uh, in reality, it's, it's a relatively low cost solution to get rid of the weeds that are out there in the field. And it's my understanding you'll take this right off the sprayer. It's a few bolts, you'll take it right off when you're done. Yeah, it's simply U-bolts. Uh, every 30 inches, put them on, uh, run the equipment, and then when I'm done, I'll take it off, put it in a box, and it'll be ready for next year. Well, I know how much you, you enjoy technology when it works. Pretty safe to say this one's gonna work pretty well. Hopefully, we've got some pretty powerful herbicides we're gonna run through it, so huh. we should be able to take care of them. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. We have it by reliable sources. Mr. Colby went back out there to see Matt in action in the field attacking those weeds. Matt may not let him come back mm. again. I don't think Matt was very proud of those weeds. Everybody has some escapes. There's more coming up here. Stay with us. Welcome back here to This Week in Agribusiness. Well, as we've been telling you each week, it's almost time for the Farm Progress Show. We're getting closer, all right, to the 2022 edition that'll be at Boone, Iowa. One of the companies that you see there when that show is at Boone is Stein Seed Company. And David Thompson, National Marketing Director for Stein, joins us here this weekend. David, it's great to have you on the broadcast. How are things looking out across those fields of Stein Seed and the, the areas that you serve? You know, here, uh, our offices are in central Iowa. I'm actually just about a half hour south of the Farm Progress Show site. Most of Iowa, pretty good uh, growing conditions this year, not without its challenges as there always are uh, all across the U.S., but um, corn crop and soybean crops are looking uh, really quite good at this point in the year, so we're excited for uh, having all the guests Central Iowa for Farm Progress Show. Yeah, it'll be nice to be back there. It's been four years since uh, the show has been there at the yeah. site in the live and direct version anyway. It was a little bit slow getting started planting this year, wasn't it? In Central Iowa, we were on a farm in that Ames area, Ames, Nevada area, and uh, it was a little bit slow going in, as I recall. A bit wet in the spring, a little slow going, and uh, the good news is once it opened up, uh, emergence was really, really good. And then, of course, like a lot of the central corn belt, we got a fair amount of heat through through June and into July. And so it seems like we're not uh, for heat units. And yet, like I said, around here, we've actually been blessed with good timely rain uh, which keeps kind of, you know, a little bit of heat and a little bit of rain is what you need. Corn. So we're, we're sitting pretty good so far. I know the announcer needs to correct that. He said Nevada. Everybody knows it's Nevada. You know, I, I got to get my Iowa town straight like Maquoka and, and places like that. <laughs> get them squared away. Yep. What will you specifically be showing folks at the Farm Progress Show this year? Oh, a couple things that, that we're excited about. Of course, we um, are a really big uh, company in terms of Enlist E3 soybeans. Uh, we were one of the first companies in the marketplace to carry that product back in 2019. Uh, so we've got a really good track record. 
2023, we're going to have 116 Enlist E3 varieties, ranging from as early as a triple zero uh, to our first group seven soybeans. So a wide range of maturities there for pretty much everybody across the, the soybean growing area of the United States. And so when we talk to growers about the Enlist system and the benefits that it has to offer, we're also going to have our uh, corn on display. You know, we have unique corn genetically suited for um, higher, higher population, higher density planting. One of the things I love about Farm Progress Show, we are one of the few companies that still has a plot uh, at Farm Progress Show. You know, growers always like to see um, plants growing. And so we take the time to plant a plot every year and we'll have some things on display there uh, showcasing genetics and, and different traits. What is the footprint of the area that Stein Seed serves? I, I think you serve more than a dozen states, don't you? Yeah, actually, uh, at this point, Max, we, we're pretty much every corn is grown um, in, in the U.S. So from Colorado out to the East Coast and Dakotas down into Texas, um, we also now have retail operations in South America, and we're launching a retail uh, operation in Europe as well. We should point out this is a family business you uh, started. I guess the family moved, if I'm not mistaken, from Pennsylvania to Iowa way back in the in the early days. And the company's been around, what, almost 80 years, correct? Yeah, so Harry Stein's our company founder. His family moved here to central Iowa in the 30s, and, and he's been here his whole life. Uh, our home base of operations is still where the family farm moved to in the 30s. And Harry is still very much involved in the day-to-day -day business. Uh, all four of his kids are involved in the in the operation, so it's very much a family company, even, even as we've continued to grow uh, over the past several decades. One thing I should do is to send folks to your website. I recall from uh, some of the awards that Stein Seed has won in the past in the National Ag Marketing Association, where I've sometimes emceed the awards program, you have a very nice website with a lot of information loaded on there for farmers. Yeah, I mean, we try to give as much information on our products and, and agronomic. We have an ag blog where they can, you know, our agronomists provide input and information. So they can go to www.steinseed.com to, to catch up on the latest information from us. We also have an app now uh, on on uh, that's available on all the major platforms. So you can download that on your phone and get product information right in your pocket. When will the seed harvest really get underway uh, as the timetable appears right now with the maturity of the crop as it has advanced? Yeah, I mean, like I said, it kind of looks like with the heat we've had, it looks like things are catching up. We're not anticipating that it's going to be a particularly um, late uh, harvest at this point. Um, so we would anticipate, you know, in, in latter part of September. Uh, of course, we harvest seed corn here locally, and that usually starts right before Labor Day. So uh, I know our team here locally is telling me that they don't anticipate any changes from our typical schedule. You must enjoy that farmer contact at showtime, don't you, David? It, it, it's fantastic. You know, we're a working farm operation here locally. I got to go do a tour here uh, later today. We have farmers coming to visit our place. Uh, we love to have growers in the United States come and see us. And uh, farm shows are a great opportunity to get a pulse of what's going on all around the country. I mentioned the website. I didn't give the website. Steinseed.com. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. And you will be at the Farm Progress Show coming up August 30th and 31st and September 1st. And we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, David. Yep. Thanks, Max. David Thompson joining us here on This Week in Agribusiness. Stein Seed Company in Iowa. Steinseed.com. And they will be at the 2022 Farm Progress Show. We hope many of you will be, too. There's more coming up here. Stay with us. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Max, technology adoption on farms isn't always driven by just the younger generation, is it? Well, they may have gotten that gene from mom or dad, as a matter of fact. I was hearing about that when I visited with Justin Weber. He farms near Geneseo, Illinois. In our Plant Smart, Grow Smart series, he talked with me about that and the fact that his dad helped bring him along. <laughs> As we look across the farmstead here, it seems to be rolling. 
Is it all that way? Not all of it. We have a mixture of hills and flat land and we farm corn and soybeans here on a mixture of different types of soils. We have some irrigation. Um, we farm along the Rock River as well. So there's a lot of different variables that we contend with every year. Talk a bit about the history of the farm. Who was here before you and your dad? Well, my great grandfather started it and then my grandfather after that, I had the privilege of growing up, working alongside my grandfather and learning from him. He passed away um, in 20, and since then, it's been a privilege you know, to work alongside my father as well. Your granddad had to see a magnitude of changes that were just overwhelming, you would think, looking at the equipment on your farm now. The last couple of years that my grandpa um, was in the nursing home, I would take pictures uh, that you know, things we would do around the farm, and I would take those to him. And some of those pictures were from our drone that we would use. And he made the comment that he's seen so much in his life. He's seen the horse and plow, and now he's seen this. So there's just so much technology and advances that occurred, you know, over his lifetime that always amazed him. You know, the main thing that my dad has taught me and is that it's important to keep up with technology or at least know what's out there. It may not be a fit for every farm, but we try to be open to new ideas, new technology, and adapt it to our farm. Do you sit down specifically at a particular time in the off season and, and really plot your strategy across your fields? Uh, my dad and I do that. We really go field by field and decide, you know, what we're gonna plant there, corner beans, you know, what, all the different, how much fertilizer, we look at soil tests, we're always soil testing, things like that. We consult with our local FS, and that's who we uh, work with, along with our BSF rep, Mike Knudsen. Well, in fact, Mike and I, we grew up together just down the road, um, classmates, so I've known Mike a long time, and uh, it's nice to have somebody you can trust and is gonna give you an honest opinion when you have a question. You bounce things off of him from time to yes. time. Maybe he'll bring you some new ideas. Yes, that's right. And, you know, as, as a farmer, you, you try to learn as much as you can, but you can't learn everything. So you rely on other people who are knowledgeable and that you can trust, you know, build those relationships um, because that, that's what it's all about is having strong relationships with the people that you work with to have a, help you have a successful crop. It was a privilege to be on the Weber Farm near Geneseo, Illinois. You can see more of our visit there by going to the website plansmartgrowsmart.com. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Some folks in the past week might have been pondering why the market was selling off at times. Maybe they were looking at a wetter weather forecast. Let's find out. Mr. Solier, in the week ahead, will there be some showers coming through? Oh, there will be multi-rounds and multi-days worth of shower activity, thunderstorms, and at times we will marry up uh, some of those cells with the jet stream. And you know this time of the year, it's that severe weather potential, that derecho potential, hail and high wind and all that. But in the meantime, farther to the west, it's been a pretty favorable setup coming off the wet springtime season, dry time, a little heat at times, moving the uh, winter wheat crop uh, towards maturity and or harvest mode. A little change in thinking of that here early in the week. A little bubble of cooler high pressure here. A uh, front is on the move. And note how the upper level winds are digging as in dropping northwest to southeast. Indications of a trough in the last of the heat here across the northern plains. And boy, it's been just horrid south. Also helping to deliver a couple of uh, thunderstorm clusters, perhaps having severe, but little if any organized moisture, mind you. In the Pacific Northwest, we're in good shape from about the Cascades on westward. Of course, to the east, a different story with dryness and drought. Look at the change in air masses here as that trough moves out into the northern plains. High pressure and control, the retrogression of the hot ridge into parts of the western states. Another benign front moving ashore in the Pacific Northwest. Seasonal warmth here, so overall pretty quiet weather picture. A lot of the action is lined up from the divide on eastward. Kind of a little bit of a winding down of the monsoon set up here before this week. Last week, week had a little tropical moisture all the way into Baja that did make its way into the uh, southwestern states. Uh, frontal 
boundary here. It has just been absolutely horrible. Record setting all time heat last week. Hobart, uh, Oklahoma, Wichita Falls, Texas at 115 degrees. Actual air temperatures, not the heat index. Uh, cooler air and a sharp trough and maybe some violent weather for parts of the plains, but organized moisture. It'll help for pasture lands at least. Not much going on in the monsoon setup over the southwest. Pretty quiet weather picture with the low clouds and fog offshore of the valleys of California as the week wears on in through California. And can we expect an eastward movement then of that rain? Beneficial moisture. Yeah, repetitive. Uh, these fronts are going to get caught up with time. Here is this cold front. We do get a prod of some heat and humidity into the plains and western Corn Belt along this boundary. Clusters of showers and thunderstorms will coalesce by the middle and late portions of the week and multi-bands, multi-day activity. Look at lined up on either side of I-80 into the central and southern Corn Belt in a slow settlement southward. Note how these fronts get lined up to the upper air pattern, so they're not going to make a lot of move quickly to the south, nor the organized rains as well. They'll repeat and recur over the same given areas. There could be in some spots literally from a uh, drought to a flood as the week wears on, localized into the plains and western Corn Belt. A little bit of leftover uh, tropical moisture monsoon in through old Mexico. Here is the hot ridge here, a piece of it. 100 plus degree weather into the Delta region. Arkansas really struggling on uh, topsoil moisture losses there. Note the cooler air. Note this trough moving across the southern plains and showers and thunderstorms heavy and severe up through the Ozarks and points on east as the hot ridge continues on to the east max. And some folks in the east, mid-Atlantic and southeast will be hot too, I bet. That's right, up past 100, feeling like 115 degrees. Uh, we need more moisture in some of these drought areas here. Of course, uh, epicenter across east central Illinois for now. Note the clusters of showers and thunderstorms, the heat and humidity replaced by uh, digging this U-shape upper air pattern right here. A couple of cold fronts and lows. These will be widespread multi-day mid to late week showers and thunderstorms, perhaps heavy and severe and soaking drenching rains will make a dent, will make an improvement in some of the uh, drought uh, conditions across the Midwest corn and bean areas. A little tropical moisture here uh, on top of the hot ridge, mind you, into the uh, Mississippi Valley Delta region. It's going to be not fit for bad nor beast, but again, some relief with drought here and a little tropical system. Yeah, that's in the maps and charts, along with the middle to late portions of the week, a movement of that triple digit heat across the areas of the Carolinas, the showers and thunderstorms turn heavy and severe. Tennessee Valley back into parts of Texas, too. Greg Sodier is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. One of my farmer friends not far from Chicago commented the other day about a good, nice, day of abundant, gentle rain. No storms. That's the kind of thing I think many farmers would like to see. No storms. So what's the feeling here of the week ahead? You know, we actually had that about 10 days, almost two weeks ago, into parts of the central Corn Belt. That percolating, absorbing, soaking rain, no hail, no high wind. And that helped in some areas, uh, but the old split, if you will, across parts of uh, the central Corn Belt, where we need more moisture. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, while the rains will come, they may be repetitive, perhaps prolific, perhaps downpour variety and certainly accompanied by severe weather uh, despite this uh, midsummer calendar date from Kansas into the heart of the Corn Belt. An inch or two localized three or four can't be ruled out uh, running over many central and southern areas and look at the downpours late in the week in particular. We will ultimately collapse the hot ridge here. Here's a little tropical system. Don't think it'll be named but it will enhance moisture where we need it across the eastern Carolinas and some of the moisture all the way down into Oklahoma and Texas too late for winter wheat obviously. Pasture Hopefully, a couple of showers and thunderstorms, monsoon set up, and widely scattered stuff, northern California mountain areas, and into the Pacific Northwest later in the week. That's severe storm stuff. That's a little bit worrisome. Yes, you can get good beneficial moisture, but the wind and the hail, that's what worries. That's right. Folks. Lodging, blowdown, green snap, all that can certainly transpire in this particular setup, but that's the really the price you pay for getting organized, significant, substantial rains. Uh, first week of August, yeah, the summer is flying on by, and a little bit of a trough here over the nation's heartland some sense of heat here, some sense of cooling into the Pacific Northwest, Northern and Central Rockies. So that usually means 
Pretty good news from a moisture gain standpoint across the heart of the drought areas, western Corn Belt, Great Plains, at least back to somewhat normal down through Texas as well. A couple of tropical systems here to keep an eye out for. It's been kind of lacking the uh, season out across the Atlantic, a bit below average on moisture here, but the heart of the Corn Belt above average, normal for the northern plains, southern Canadian prairie, and two into the Pacific Northwest. You start talking about tropical systems, I wonder, is there a big one lurking out there somewhere? You know, it's been amazingly quiet. Uh, part of that, a lot of dust off the uh, uh, African coast, the Saharan Desert, that inhibits the uh, development of cloud activity. Too much condensation nuclei is not a good thing. That's how you make the clouds and start the circulation, by the way, in the tropical systems. The hot ridge, a small one, back into play here as we approach the mid-stretch of August. We think maybe some tropical cloudiness here, a bit below average into the northeast and uh, out through the northwestern part of the country. Normal temperatures anticipated. And we do get uh, kind of a drier spell across the western Corn Belt, Great Plains. You almost get this ring of fire set up briefly returning over the heartland. Some monsoon moisture too across the southwest. Active storm clusters. Oh, this is a setup that could be heavy and severe northern and eastern Corn Belt. Some tropical rains over the southeastern sections of the country. My goodness. So there appears to be no shortage of precipitation in the major soybean producing states as we move on into that critical period of the month of August. It looks good. It does look good. Absolutely. Now as we get a little bit de deeper on here into the month of August, we do the hot ridge kind of begins to materialize here. Briefly so northern and central plains, western parts of the Corn Belt, temperatures below average over the southeastern part of the country. We do see drier weather for the western Corn Belt Great Plains as we move through the third week of August. Next on this week in agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. In a modern farm shop where there's a lot of modern equipment, you expect to see those machines sitting there at some time or another or just outside the shop. You're not expecting to see something like this. I'll tell you about it in Max's Tractor Shed, brought to you by Storelock Tool Cabinets. Check out what they have to sell. Check out the various configurations and the colors available, a wide array of colors, at storelock.com. Well, the Schrock boys, David and his son Zach at Bremen, Indiana, that's Marshall County, Indiana, the northern part of the state, are good progressive charge ahead operators. They're trying to make the most of their opportunity out there on the land to produce crops bigger and bigger yields each year. So you're not necessarily expecting when you go into their shop to see this. Uh, it's a 70 year old Ford Jubilee, not yet restored. If I understood correctly, it was Elmer Smith's tractor back in the day. I believe Dave Schrock said it was his grandfather-in-law's machine. And while it's not spruced up yet, hang on, one of these days I bet you it will be. But until then, no, it's not tucked away in a corner. It hasn't been relegated to a remote rundown shed. It hasn't been hidden away under a tarp. This Ford Jubilee from 1953 is so easy to see right there on Schrock Farms at Bremen, Indiana. We get to see Mark Stock each week, too, as he gives us the lineup. He comes in to fill us in on what's going on. He'll show us the machine specifically that will be moving on big iron auctions in the week ahead. Well, Max, the online auction calendar is getting full at BigIron.com. We've got some commercial real estate selling on July 26th in Sedalia, Missouri. July 27th, 1,508 items will sell for sellers across the country, including Dahlgren Cattle Company out of Bertrand, Nebraska. They've got a 1986 Caterpillar 615 elevated scraper. They've got a Brent 1194 grain cart. We've also got the David and Colleen Emdorf retirement sale in Dakin, Nebraska. This auction features a 2016 Case IH 5140 Combine. They've got a super sharp 2000 year model International 2554 tandem axle grain truck. They've got a 2013 Case IH Maxim 125 tractor with a loader with only 1,081 hours. Then we've got a special retirement sale on July the 28th for 4A Farms out of Atchison, Kansas. 162 items selling, including a 2014 Case IH 8230 Combine. They have a New Holland T8030 mechanical front tractor, also selling a Kinsey. 3600 16-31 planner and they have a 1995 New Holland 8670 two-wheel drive tractor and for those who want to sell equipment during the big farm progress farm show in Boone Iowa the deadline to get your equipment listed on that big sale is this upcoming week call your area big iron rep today or go to bigiron.com
It's midsummer, but FFAs across the country are gearing up for another school year of educating folks on the ways of agriculture. And we're meeting one of those folks. Anna Marie Stone is a vice president of Missouri FFA. And Anna Marie, you just beginning your term as vice president. What are you excited about for this next year? Yeah, so I'm really just excited to meet new people. Um, if you know one thing about me, you know that I love talking to other people. And because I get to serve Missouri FFA and the association, I'm just so excited to meet everybody from across the state and just go and start chapter visits and really, really make those connections. When you were first getting involved in FFA, did you like seeing the state officers come around and get involved in, in your local chapter? Yes, so I, idol, I idolized state, off, state FFA officers. I was like, I want to be one of those one day. And I thought it was like, it's kind of surreal because I am one now. I'm like, oh my goodness, freshman Anna Marie is so excited right now. And I'm just like, it was just so like cool that they actually wanted to talk to me as a person. I was like, I'm no, they don't want to talk to me. I'm weird. I'm not normal. But now I'm like, I want to talk to everybody like everybody is so special and everybody's so cool and everybody has their own story to tell. So yes, I definitely I definitely idolize state officers and I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity. So what do you like to see? What are you hoping to see in your future? Anna Maria, as you go out, you go to school. Do you want to stay involved in the ag industry? Yes, I absolutely want to stay involved in the agriculture industry. Actually, I just graduated from Centralia High School and this fall I'm heading to the University of Missouri Columbia to major in agriculture education with an emphasis in teacher certification. And I my dream is to one day return back to a classroom to become an agriculture educator and FFA advisor. And are you going to continue to be doing work on the farm, Anna Marie? Yeah, so at my house, I have a small herd of purebred Charlotte cattle and I'm expanding to Red Angus, as well as I own my own business where I sell chickens. So I'm definitely still planning on working at the farm, raising my cattle and continuing to grow my business. That is fantastic. Anna Marie Stone, Missouri State FFA Vice President. Anna Marie, we wish you the very best as school gets ready to start here for the new year in 2022. Thank you so much. In hundreds of communities across the country, what's happening in the ethanol industry is crucial, not just to farmers, but Mike, to many other folks as well. I understand there's a conference coming up you'll attend. There certainly is, Max. I'm very excited about the 35th annual ACE Ethanol Conference happening in Omaha, Nebraska in August. Joining us to talk about it is Katie Muckenhern. She's the Vice President of Public Affairs at the American Coalition for Ethanol. And Katie, when is the big ACE Conference? Yep, it, it's coming up. We're less than a month away. It's taking place August 10th through the 12th in Omaha at the Marriott at, in the Capital District area. So we, we were there in 2019. It's a great venue and we're just looking to get everyone together under one roof um, to, you know, celebrate you know, all the accomplishments we've had over the past year, but also just get together and discuss ways that we can continue moving the ethanol industry forward. That is the key. A lot of interest in ethanol here in 2022. Katie, what will attendees be learning? What are the different options for tracks at the conference? Yeah, you know, th there's just, we're covering a range of topics. We're going to cover everything from the latest in market development um, topics, as well as policy efforts. And then I really hope that, you know, attendees can just take away some key insights on how they, they can improve their farming operations and their ethanol operations. So, um, you know, we're really, we have a few keynote speakers. Um, we, we're gonna welcome um, Governor Ricketts. He's gonna kick off the conference for us. And we'll have um, updates from ACE leadership, um, Brian Jennings, our CEO, and Ron Lamberty, as well as our ACE board president, President Dave Sovereign. Um, he represents Golden Grain Energy out of Iowa. But really, we're covering the gamut. We have a, a one, wonderful general session panels, and then some more intimate um, breakout sessions as well that that cover you know leadership and management, technology specific tracks, and then we have a bunch that cover um, carbon topics specifically. Now that's interesting. Carbon is very hot right now. It seems to be in the headlines all the time. What will you be talking about from an ethanol perspective with regard to carbon? 
Yeah, and in fact, that um, intensity is our um, our theme for this year's event. So that's talking about how you know ACE and you know the entire industry. We're just looking at how we can help farmers and ethanol producers drive down their carbon intensity scores. So one of our breakout sessions will cover um, a calculator tool that ACE developed to just educate um, you know producers on how. What is my carbon score and how can I calculate that? We'll also be covering the California low carbon fuel standard market. Um, we're covering carbon capture and storage. That's really a hot topic. We actually have a general session dedicated to that where we'll have someone from Summit Carbon Solutions. It's a pu pipeline project um, who will be there to talk about their efforts as well as Vault. And they, they talk about on site carbon capture and storage. Um, and then we also have, um, we're covering carbon capture and storage um, tax credits as well. Interesting, a lot of factors coming together and you'll be talking to BJ Johnson of Clear Flame Engines as well. Absolutely, so BJ at Clear Flame, they're doing work in the heavy transportation, heavy duty transportation sector. That's, you know, a new market that's, that's Get gaining a lot of traction. Um, we're, we're dedicating a whole panel to just covering some of these new uses and markets for ethanol producers because I think if COVID taught us anything, it's that you know we can't rely just on one um, you know fuel. We need to you know producers are looking at how can I, we diversify our operations and take advantage of some of these new growth opportunities. That's the key, folks. Ace Ethanol Conference coming up August 10th, 11th, and 12th in Omaha. Well, Max, folks can go to ethanol.org to get more information on the conference. Am I correct? There'll be a Mike Pearson availability there. They'll be able to see you and talk to you in person. <laughs> they certainly will. All three days I'll be there. I'm very excited oh, about it. Goodness, Pearson in person. That's, that's right. That's powerful. <laughs> we hope you'll be here with us in person next week for this week in agribusiness. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great, safe week. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.